our next um, star-studded panel of educators and lifelong learners. Can we have you up here? That's terrific. Um, I'm just going to let them start once we're all here. Bronwyn Stuckey, Nick Fortuno, Barry Joseph. There are two apologies for the panel, uh, Yasmin Kafai and they Linda Poland, who are both very de dedicated uh, academics who weren't able to get away from their institutions at this time, but we're ably um, represented. All right, so, <laughs> all right, if we can just um, have our attention up here to the panelists and we'll, we'll begin this conversation. And it's all about Minecraft. No PVP, please, during the session. Yeah. Hi, so welcome to our CNN wall of expert panel on, uh, on, on Minecraft. Um, we don't have a ton of time for a ton of people. So these are the people. Uh, this is Snow Kid. Um, so you can see who they are, so I'm, I'm not even going to waste time on introductions except to, to have people maybe say something about themselves as they go. Um, what we want to do basically is have a conversation about Minecraft and the way Minecraft is actually used in educational settings. I apologize that I'm speaking very quickly, I'm very conscious of time. Um, so really, what, like, I only have a kind of handful of questions that I want this discussion to be about and I really want it to be a discussion. So we're just going to kind of jump right in and basically the, the interest here is in the way that Minecraft is used educationally, and specifically that has to do with, I think, basically two real issues. The first is, Minecraft, if it's a tool for education, is a tool, and we have to think about good uses and bad uses of it. And by looking at examples of how it's been used, I think we can see some case studies of like what we've learned about it and what we haven't, recognizing that we're still very early in thinking about how games could be used in classrooms in this setting in any way. And then the second thing, which I think is the critical question for all of us thinking about games and education is, to what extent does Minecraft have inherent qualities that's going to make it valuable to us as an educational tool, and to what extent is it effectively just a shiny object that's designed to like get away from traditional structures that children may not find engaging, but that has no real inherent value in the educational process. And so I think those are the things that we want to talk about today. Is that fair? Yep. Rock. That is hopefully the last thing I'm going to say besides asking questions. Um, so. I think the best way to start is to look at some examples of the way people have worked and you know, we want to make sure we just keep everything kind of tight given the amount of people who have to speak. So I'd like to start by looking at this from really the fundamental experience that it is, which is the experience of someone being educated and teaching themselves through Minecraft. And so if Snowkit, you would like to start by talking a little bit about your experiences uh, with, with Minecraft as, a, as an educational tool. Okay, so, um, well, what I learned from Minecraft was leadership skills and cooperation. Uh, well, I learned leadership skills from, I owned a town in Minecraft, and I pretty much had to help out my, um, like, my residents and everyone. And then, like, we all shared materials. So that's, like, um, some cooperation, some leadership. And then I also had to learn spelling so I could actually use the commands correctly. And um, I wasn't just typing random stuff. So I think those are just a few examples. I mean, there are a lot of other examples, and I pr could probably go on for a really long time. So yeah. Well, so Joel, you said there, were, there was an example that you wanted to talk about as well, of how, how you used Minecraft. Uh, yes. So on, on, on that note, I think um, the way we, um, Juan from Global Kids, and the way we've used Minecraft is we've been using a sort of a, a mashup between uh, Hunger Games and Minecraft. Uh, we call it uh, Hunger Craft, and we piloted with uh, um, the Brooklyn Public Library, and then we create a gameplay where we are reproducing the dynamics of the actual Hunger Games. When we create the, the capital in one group of kids, and then the District 12 in the second one, and we create this uh, gameplay where there is um, uh, exchange of resources, some of them have, the others ones don't have, 
and then through this gameplay, then there is a discussion at the end where kids begin to examine their role in during the gameplay. We work with uh, Minecraft EDU. I see Joel um, Levin over there, so he's been re really great. Uh, so when uh, you talk about collaboration, that's like the things that we have seen uh, happening in this gameplay. Uh, kids are talking, uh, communicating with each other, um, collaborating to see if they can obtain their resources from one place um, to the other. So that's the way we've seen Minecraft being successful in this, um, in this, in this particular setting. We, we, really, we really love it and we are actually also taking into account the interest uh, on popular culture from the Hunger Games and the interest of kids using Minecraft. Who here has been to the American Museum of Natural History? And if you're not from New York, I can just leave it with that. Thank you. There's youth all around New York City who don't think that they belong at the museum, who don't identify as science learners, who never choose to come to experience many of the things that came to your mind the moment I asked you if you'd been before. So for us, Minecraft has been a way to explore how to engage young people around something they're already interested in, to bring them into the space, to give them a science experience within Minecraft, but then bring them to the exhibits and see the connections between the two in a facilitated uh, learning environment. After we help generate that need to know, the second step is then to figure out how can we use that engagement with Minecraft to then teach them that content and meet that new need. And that's something we're still trying to explore. And I talked about that on my blog, mooshme.org, M-O-O-S-H-M-E.org. I just want to give a quick plug here. Um, I, I'm engaged in projects with Minecraft, but this whole panel was instigated out of a wiki called the Minecraft Experience. And if you go to minecraftexperience.net, you can see people all over the world contributing stories of how um, you know, they're employing Minecraft and the kinds of learning described. Um, and we're talking about um, unique environments, homeschooling, schools, um, community groups, all kinds of ventures, family play, lots of parents are contributing. Um, so it's a really juicy space to go and see a much broader description of Minecraft at play than we can give you today. It's kind of mapping the genome. Uh, so I'll just jump in. I, for, first of all, I want to do a shout out to Joel, who's really done the hard work. Um, he's right up there as a classroom teacher of of, of, of um, figuring out how we could leverage Minecraft and make it available for teachers to really integrate in ways that didn't break the spine. And, and one, one of the challenges, I'm, I'm a director of a center where, where we think about how can we leverage games for impact. And, and one of the challenges we have are how do you co-opt the power of Minecraft um, and kind of insert adult sanctioned goals and parent goals into this space without kind of undermining the value that it is for kids. And I think it's a real challenge, and I think rather than kind of running from it or jumping into it, treating that as a research challenge um, has been really interesting in our perspective. And I think that sometimes that's involved developing impact guides that parents can use and teachers can use for having questions with kids, and sometimes it involves um, going into where kids are and not touching it in some ways, but looking at what they're bringing out of the experience and supporting conversations around those. And so I think that you know whether we position it for our goals or whether we try to leverage the successful stories that they're having there as an advocate for what learning could look like, it's a really powerful medium in both forms. So I, I think like, you know, I, you know I, I think there's a lot of like good kind of concise descriptions of ways that Minecraft has been used educationally, I guess, Part of what I think about when I think about this as someone who's been doing educational games for a long time, there have been a lot of kind of open worlds in the past, Second Life being like really the, the big one before this. So why do you think Minecraft has been more successful? Um, and do you, like, certainly more successful in adoption, but why do you think it's been adopted so readily within educational centers and why do you think it's a, potentially a better tool if you do think it's a better tool? So there's a lot, we can, we can spend a few hours on this one. You know, obviously, uh, what Minecraft has become is what Second Life always wanted to be in some ways. But also Second Life never wanted to be what Minecraft is. Second Life was a place for adults. And when it worked with young people, it was in a separate place that was cordoned off 
uh, as a separate sphere for youth type activities as opposed to adult type activities. Minecraft has always been a space that never had an age label on it. So it allows people across ages to connect with each other, learn from each other, and it meant that youth who wanted to get involved, and I'm curious to hear your perspective, didn't feel like they were doing the youth only thing. Sometimes that's a plus, and youth can develop leadership. In Second Life, youth ran the largest a fictional uh, youth economy in the world, owning lands, running the businesses, and that was remarkable. But often, there were more youth in the main grid, in the adult grid, because that's where the action was, that's where the people were. And so in Minecraft, you have an opportunity to not have those artificial barriers in that space. And at the same time, Minecraft's tool set is much easier and open to use while still giving some scaffolding. I just want to defer to Snowkit and No Clue on this because they've been involved in OpenSim, Quest Atlantis, Minecraft, um, Lego Universe, Second Life, all of those. And I think they're probably the people best positioned to answer this question. You've done it all. Have you used Second Life? Um, well, no, I haven't really other did like I haven't really used that many. I mean, I've done Quest Atlantis and all like that. But I haven't really played Second Life, and I'm thinking about it because one of my other friends play it, so I'm kind of interested. Yeah, and I just want to clear that's not Second Life. We use a private open sim, and uh, we've always had a private open sim for our school, and we're actually seeing a reemergence now that they've been into Minecraft. They're li they're enjoying going back to that sophistication. So I don't think it's a straight line. Um, the thing. I think that makes Minecraft so accessible is that the kids are playing it outside of school and they've already discovered it and they've built their own community and it's the school that is trying to catch up, which has uh, been really interesting. But I, I think like uh, on what Barry was talking, I think making a, um, a simple game platform is very complex. And I think that uh, Minecraft, it's, it's very easy to use. Uh, I mean, if you have ever tried to build an object in Second Life, you can just compare and see uh, how the, the, quite the difference between the two platforms. And I think that lends for um, kids, but also for a wide range of ages to use the platform and allows for creativity and, and, and building uh, things and getting used to um, create and, and play in the, in the world. I have to say logistically, uh, getting into an um, open sim or uh, was really difficult, costly, and very difficult with the firewalls. Minecraft is so flexible easy and cost effective that it's uh, it's a no-brainer for schools. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think what Minecraft did really good is there's a, there's a strong balance between what I'll call productive constraint and player agency. And the way that kids go back and forth between I'm playing in their world versus I'm making my world. And the, the ease with which you can jump back and forth is so empowering. And for a lot of the kids, I mean, Henry Jenkins had this great quote a number of years ago about the spaces for consequentiality that, that are kind of available in kids' lives today are so limited. And the one place that many kids are finding real power and real agency and doing it in a collaborative form where other people are going in and validating their work and they can continually expand their expertise is in Minecraft. It really allows that, that dance of agency between I'm, I'm kind of experiencing and I'm doing so quickly, which is such an important part of exploring learning and feeling like I matter in, in the world. Um, the, other, the other thing I want to just mention briefly is the Minecraft has had this weird phenomenon where sometimes it's the game and sometimes it's the boundary object where the game is really our conversations around what we're doing in there. And I, don't, I, don't, I haven't seen many places that have allowed that to move back and forth so naturally between it being a boundary object for our interaction versus it is our interaction. And that's just a wonderful space. And if we could do that with educational curriculum more, I think we'd find some real power where it leaves our classroom and goes into their lives um, and leaves our lessons and becomes their stories. I was just going to ask Snow Clue. Um, <laughs> Snow Clue. She did it. <laughs> she did it. Um, uh, to tell us about um, Escape Tomorrow, because I think when we talk about agency, they have a project that's brilliant, and I'd really like Snow Kid to tell us a little bit about that. Thank you. Okay, so Escape Tomorrow is a game that I helped design, 
and it's pretty much you're on this planet that's about to be destroyed by meteors, and scientists found another planet that you could go to, but like there are three nations, and they all have to cooperate to build spaceships to get to the other planet. So, yeah. And I just want to clarify, just being very modest, uh, she's a veteran and a guru, and we've been doing this for three years. We're actually presenting on Ed Webb this afternoon the game that the kids crowdsourced designed over a period of a year and then shared with the world. It was based on the popularity of the Hunger Games and uh, John Hunter's World Peace Game, believe it or not. And we uh, took the approach of not teaching with Minecraft, but watching how the kids use Minecraft and what they do in Minecraft is create games. So in our school we started to look at ways to um, tap into that and let our kids become game designers. And so uh, check out Ed Webb this afternoon and Snow Kit will be presenting and will be telling our story and the game is free for you to take back and play it at your school or with your community groups, change it, mod it, improve it. That's the spirit of uh, Minecraft, right? I want to follow up on, on what you guys were just talking about before about this idea of agency and that's constrained enough to, to make you feel like you're not overwhelmed and it gives you, young people the space to feel this is an environment that they can make a difference around. My son is turning eight in two weeks. All he wants to do for his birthday is play Minecraft with his friends. So they're just going to go in and play. But he wants to make sure they know in advance that there's some rules that he set out. So he was dictating them to me this morning. One of them was no killing other players. Another one was you can't uh, destroy anyone's house without their permission. Another one was supposed to have fun which told me a few things. It told me that that wasn't the norm. Right? <laughs> and he knows that, and he's aware of that. But this is his party, so he gets to set the rules, and there's going to be consequences if you don't follow them. And he started having to think about, well, who's going to make sure that people aren't destroying each other's houses? Can we trust each other? Does an adult need to be there to watch? And so he was thinking about what it meant to manage a space that was designed for him to engage with his friends and peers, but knowing that there's different cultural norms that are anticipated in that environment. And he's thinking for the first time about how do you set and define those rules, how do you negotiate them, how do you negotiate them with your peers. So that speaks very much to what you're talking about, that Minecraft has a power when youth get to go into that space and define it. But then when we start th talking about bringing it into structured learning spaces, whether it's a classroom or an informal learning space in a museum, we then have to negotiate between that existing process of youth um, managing their cultural norms and what we're used to doing in our teaching environments and how to find that sweet spot where, as it was discussed earlier, we can still let the young people feel like they're engaging on their terms, but they're still meeting the educational goals that we have in place and support them to identify internally that those goals are for them as well. It was really hard when we started doing Minecraft at the museum when we had young people going into Minecraft when we had to say, okay, this was just a free build time with some of the skills we just explored. Now we need to focus on the content. And they had to shift their cultural norms and expectations about how they were engaging in the space with what we were expecting. And it wasn't that they were right and we were wrong or vice versa. We just had to learn how to communicate and understand what those norms were. So I guess uh, from all of your perspectives, I'd like to hear everyone talk about this briefly. If someone in the audience is thinking about either using Minecraft specifically in a classroom or informal learning set, uh, uh, environment, um, or if they are already using it and trying to figure out a better way to do that, what advice do you have from the experience that you've had about the best way to leverage Minecraft or when to recognize Minecraft as a good tool to leverage? Okay, well, I'll jump in on that because I have a, a very definite opinion and, and set of pedagogies that I'm interested in seeing played out. And I see lots of examples where teachers have a lot of fun doing elaborate builds and then set the students loose to play a 10-minute exercise inside that world. And I think that's, that's um, not realising optimal benefit of Minecraft. From, from everything people have said here about agency, um, when kids do the design, when they do negotiation, when they design the rules and, and you know, the, the constitution of the spaces that they're designing in, that's when we really see, really see the gold standard. And you see that flowing out into lots of places, as, as um, Sasha said, you know, in boundary objects, in conversations, in guilds, in other spaces, into that big G um, game that Jim G talks about. And I think that's where um, we really should be aiming. When parents talk to me because they know that I'm doing something with Minecraft for education and all they know is their kids playing Minecraft and they can't get them to stop, they ask me, they, they kind of come to me like a doctor when you say, you know, my elbow hurts, can you help me at a party? They want to know what I can do to help them. What I usually tell them is just have a conversation and just ask them, 
what do you prefer to do, creative or survival? And I say, don't worry, you don't need to know what that means. Just ask them, and they'll start explaining what it means. And just as young people engage in Minecraft in different ways, we as educators have many different options as well. You have the mechanics that exist within Minecraft and within Minecraft DDU, which has separate features for educators. Then you have mods that people have made. When I heard the Shed Aquarium was doing stuff, I thought, what can you be doing with marine life? There's one little weird squid. Well, they found mods out there that exist that other people created. And then you can create your own features that you can bring into the space. So it's a very powerful environment for education in part because you can use what's there, you can use what other users have created, and then you can work to make your own. Yeah, I mean, it's really important to remember a tool has a function for a purpose and you wanna make sure that the purposes you're enlisting it for match the functionalities of the tool. Now, Minecraft's a little bit odd because it seems to be new functionalities with it come out every day. You know, I mean, more Pixelmon is a new mod that came out recently that allows me to play Pokemon in Minecraft. You'd never think about that being a place where I could extend my Pokemon awareness. I, I, was, I recently went on a ride with someone and they had used olive oil, um, I, I ride horses, to, um, it's very dry in the desert, to lube the, the, um, the reins of their horse. Um, and we were riding through and it got pretty difficult at one point and the reins broke and the, the, you can imagine the horse went a little bit crazy and ran off. And that would be a great example where olive oil is a really powerful sustenance. You can eat it, you can use it, for the, but using it to kind of treat leather is not the best use. And a lot of us think, wow, Minecraft's so powerful, I'm just gonna use, well, why are you gonna use it? What purpose is it gonna serve? And really thinking through what is the ecosystem that you're trying to integrate it in is very, very powerful. The, the, the other thing that's really important, um, I went through, I'm a parent also of three kids who are obsessed with Minecraft. And there's moments that are just amazing, like when my seven-year-old unprompted comes up and says, why do I have to close these brackets? And I'm like, what? What do you mean brackets? And I'm realizing, oh my gosh, this kid's coding. And he saw it in a YouTube video and now he's trying to do it in Minecraft. That's pretty cool. There's other times when I'm like, get, the, get outside. Like, really get off Minecraft, we're done. We're over today. And what I realized is Kevin Crowley was, a, was an expert educator um, who uncovered this concept of an island of expertise. And where you see the real power of learning coming out is when kids develop a deep understanding about a particular construct as opposed to a shallow one. And what's so powerful about Minecraft is letting people have that time to build that expertise and not simply put them into your agendas and then get them out really quickly when they've reached that. And that's hard for us to give up some of that control and let the kid have the expiration time, but that's part of the power of this medium. Um, I think that uh, for me, um, Minecraft, but games in general, I'm interested in, um, as a minority and as working with minorities, I'm interested in creating spaces where kids have um, the power of create personal narratives, narratives that are important to them because we've always been told what to read, what to see, what to play. Um, and when the kids begin to create uh, their own narratives, is, is that's when I, I really begin to see um, what, you know, how this tool, uh, Minecraft in this case, but games in general um, are, are uh, important for us to use in educational settings. then I'm gonna point this back. I, and I have to say, and I'm just, I'm not gonna mince words, I think when teachers bring Minecraft into school and use it to teach content, they're missing the point, they're dumbing down the game. And that if you really, maybe we need to be looking at the kids, and, and Sasha, you've been talking to this beautifully about how they're using it, maybe that can inform us how we can be more effective in school in tapping into that learning that is so dynamic and all the things that have been, uh, we've been talking about here and really it's been uh, the reason and I think the reason that um, Bron invited wanted uh, the students from our school to come and Martha's such a great representative is because when they're brought to that conversation they changed and one of the most important things that we did was sit down and play with the kids all summer and what blew me away is that Martha was creating games within the game and that would have never occurred to me and that's really informed the way that we approach this platform and I think that the deep the learning has gone so much deeper in our school but not it's not about the game it's translating into the classroom and i think that that's the most important part and what is the, what is the project that you've done that you're the most proud of or what do you want teachers to know about as from a kid's point of view about all of this 
Um, well, what I'm most proud of is probably the uh, Minecraft Institute of Technology, um, MIT. Yeah, MIT. Um, so. You want to tell them a little tiny bit about what you're doing this summer? So um, we're opening opening up this summer camp, and it's in MIT, um, Minecraft MIT. So it's pretty much where we're going to be teaching like redstone, which is kind of like circuits. Um, we'll be teaching like how to kill mobs more efficiently. Um, just those like those need to know things. Right. <laughs> uh, wait, we unfortunately we are completely out of time. So unbelievably, we did not manage to resolve the question of Minecraft and education in a half an hour with six people. Um, but <laughs> but can we get a round of applause for everybody for trying? Hopefully, at least sparked interesting conversation about different uses of Minecraft with education and the questions about how you use educational tools. We invite you all to head back over to the main center for the talks there. Thank you very much, and we'll all be around the rest of the day. Yeah,